the Republican presidential candidate, Dr. Ben Carson, as all of our viewers here in the United States and around the world know, he's surging in the polls right now. He's just behind the front runner, Donald Trump, in almost all of the national and key state polls. He's also fighting off some major controversies right now. Dr. Carson is out with a brand new book today. It's entitled A More Perfect Union, what we the people can do to reclaim our constitutional liberties. And Dr. Ben Carson is joining us here right now live. And Dr. Carson, thanks very much for joining us. A pleasure. I want to talk about the book, talk about the controversies, but your immediate reaction to the breaking news in the House of Representatives. Kevin McCarthy, a man I assume you know, has announced he's dropping out of the race for speaker. I say kudos to, uh, to Representative McCarthy uh, for putting others before himself. This is not something that we see very often in Washington, and I hope it's a, a trait that uh, will be emulated by others as time goes on because, you know, we have a lot of problems that have to be solved, and none of us should put ourselves ahead of those problems. Who would you like to see emerge as the replacement to John Boehner as the next speaker? Well, I, I hope that uh, this will open the process and that even more names will be thrown in and that they will all have an opportunity to express, you know, their vision for the country and how their leadership style will be manifested and then allow the members to vote. Are you in general with uh, the more establishment, moderate Republican wing in the House of Representatives or the Tea Party supporters, let's call them the renegade wing that effectively convinced uh, Kevin McCarthy to pull out? I'm for the logical wing, for the people who want to do the things that will solve the problems in this country. And I don't really care which side of the aisle they come from. Well, do you, the, the two other names that are in there, Daniel Webster, Jason Chaffetz, you like them? Uh, I like them both. You, you, could you see either one of them or both of them emerging? Uh, absolutely. And anybody else you like? Um, I, will, I will talk about them as they enter their names into the contest. Because you've heard this, this momentum already building. It's only been minutes since Kevin McCarthy dropped out. Uh, that Paul Ryan, uh, who was the vice presidential nominee last time around, uh, chairman of the Budget Committee, maybe he should think about it. I like him, too. You like him all. All right. <laughs> but you're, you think this is a good move, that McCarthy has decided to step I, out? It's a very unselfish move and, and done for the right reasons. All right, let's talk about some of the controversies uh, that you've, uh, I, I guess, generated over the past few days. Uh, uh, you, you've been severely criticized, as you well know, for this comment you made about the massacre at that community college in Oregon when you said this. I'll play the clip. Okay. Not only would I probably not cooperate with them, I would, I would not just stand there and let them shoot me. I would say, hey, guys, everybody attack him. He may shoot me, but he can't get us off. Uh, you seem to suggest the victims should have done more. No, not suggesting that at all. Uh, what the original question was, was if you were there and someone was holding a gun to you and asking you about your religion and they had shot other people, what would you do? And uh, knowing that you were next to be killed and that they were going to continue to down the line killing people, uh, I would much rather go down fighting. And if all of us attack the shooter, the chances are very strong that not all of us will be killed. To me, that doesn't seem like a very controversial thing. But when you take it out of context and you try to make it look like I'm criticizing the victims, that's when it becomes controversial. And that's one of the things I'm hoping that the news media will stop doing. Because they, reading this book, you'll see that the press is the only business that's protected by our Constitution. The reason they are protected is because it was assumed that they would be honest and they would be on the side of the people and not have an agenda. Well, the, the press is, there's a lot of different parts of the press. We can get into that in a little bit. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the victims, uh, a guy by the name of Matthew Downing, he was offended by your comments. He told CNN, I'm fairly upset. He, meaning you, he said that nobody could truly understand what actions they would take like that in a situation unless they lived it. You understand why he's worried, concerned about what you said? I, I suspect he probably has had it fed to him by somebody who who misconstrued it. Uh, and I think if, if he heard the complete explanation such as I gave, he would know that I'm not complaining about any of the victims. And he would know that I'm trying to plant the seed because this may not be the last time that this occurs. And uh, if it occurs again and there's a bunch of people, they might start thinking, you know what, we're not going to just uh, take this. And that's one of the things that was learned from Flight 93 on 9-11. 
Chris Mintz, uh, one of the heroes, one of the survivors, he was shot seven times. He resisted. Uh, he's he's, uh, he's uh, relatively okay right now. He's been released from the uh, hospital, but he's a military veteran. Not everybody are, is a military veteran and has experience in dealing with a gunman like this. Uh, you don't have to be a military veteran. Do you remember um, the, uh, the Virginia shooting and the college campus? Uh, afterwards, I'm told that they came out with guidelines for the students to tell them what to do if a situation like that arises again. And it included throwing everything you could possibly throw at the shooter. Uh, you know, he's not going to be able to deal with all of it. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense, they were saying, attack him. You, you spoke about a personal incident in a Sirius XM uh, radio interview yesterday uh, when you were younger and you were confronted by a gunman. I'll play the little clip. Sure. This is from the radio interview. Okay. Guy comes in, puts the gun in my ribs, and I, I just said, I believe that you want the guy behind the counter. He thought <laughs> that's I was. He that's what you was, said. In that calm way? In just that the, calm right, way. In that calm way, okay. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> Over there. And, oh, so you just misdir redirected him I to. Redirected okay. Him. It, that sounds counter to what you're recommending that's, right now. That's a completely different situation. This is somebody who comes into an, a, a joint to rob it. Not somebody who's sequentially killing people. But you didn't know if, he was just going to rob the joint. I did know he that. He potentially could have killed you. I did know that. And the fact of the matter is, you know, maybe this is a, a level of sophistication that people learn from living on the streets. But I knew that that guy was not there to how murder you, how everybody. How could you possibly know that he had a gun? I knew he was not there to murder all the people. I knew he was there to rob the place. And that's why you said, look at the guy over there, just rob the place and then get out? Exactly. When was that? How long ago was that? It was when I was a resident, so it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah. And the other controversy you've erupted on this issue is in your new book, A More Perfect Union, What We the People Can Do to Reclaim Our Constitutional Liberties, is this, a reference to guns and Nazi Germany. You're familiar with this. I'll read a couple sentences from the book. German citizens were disarmed by their government in the late 1930s, and by the mid-1940s, Hitler's regime had mercilessly slaughtered six million Jews and numerous others whom they considered inferior. Through a combination of removing guns and disseminating deceitful propaganda, the Nazis were able to carry out their evil intentions with relatively little resistance. So what is the, what is the point you're trying to make? If, if there had been guns in Germany, my, there might not have been a Holocaust? My, my point is they were, that was only one of the countries that I mentioned. There were a number of countries where tyranny reigned. And before it happened, they disarmed the people. That was the point. Noah Webster said when he was talking about tyranny that the people of America would never suffer tyranny because they are armed. So, but just clarify, if, if there had been no gun control uh, laws in Europe at that time. Would six million Jews have been slaughtered? I think the likelihood of, of Hitler being able to accomplish his goals would have been greatly diminished if the people had been armed. Because they had a powerful military machine, as you know, the Nazis. I, under I understand that. They could have simply gone in, and they did go in and wipe out whole communities. But realize there was a reason that they took the guns first, right? So you, you believe that if they had guns, maybe it could have been eased? Is that what you're saying? I'm telling you that there is a reason that these dictatorial people take the guns first. Should kindergarten teachers be armed? My point is that many of the places where these mass shootings occur are gun-free zones. So these people who are crazed, but not so crazy as to go into a place where they're likely to get shot, they select these places because they know that they're not going to meet resistance. So whether it's a kindergarten teacher who was well trained or a retired policeman or someone who can stop the carnage, I think that makes a lot of sense. So you're recommending, and you correct me if I'm wrong, elementary schools have guards, armed guards, or at least the teachers be armed? I, I, I am saying that they should have some mechanism whereby they can defend themselves. What does that mean, some mechanism? That, that means not allowing this person just to come in and have free reign. We should have someone there who is armed, who is trained, and who can handle the weapon. And, and just to be precise, I want to wrap up the gun issue. You don't want any additional gun laws in the United States, or do you believe there is room for closing the loophole to buy a, a gun at a gun show, for example, okay. or to have greater background checks if someone has psychological issues? I'm a very reasonable person, you'll find. And as long as we don't compromise the Second Amendment, 
I'm open for all kinds of discussions. You know, we're smart people and we need to be able to use our collective intellect instead of getting on opposite sides and throwing hand grenades at each other to solve this problem.